key to this exhibition is the title of the show, Imaginary Solutions, because Imaginary Solutions is part of a, an expression coined by the French symbolist poet and playwright Alfred Jarry. And he described pataphysics as the science of imaginary solutions. And very early on in Barry Fennigan's career, in fact, in around 1962, he was given a copy of the Evergreen Review, which was dedicated to pataphysics. And since that time, pataphysics played a major role in determining his approach to the creative process, but not only his approach to creative process, the, his approach to actually life, life and work. So the allowing of solutions which are imaginary without predetermination and allowing the materials in effect to speak for themselves. This conjuring with materials and materiality and with their property is key to his work and to this show, which combines early work with later work and goes across his oeuvre, showing all the different disciplines. I think it's interesting that when Barry Fanagan first started working and when he, when he went to art school, he was, he was studying architecture to begin with. And previous to that, he had been working on a building site, a building site in Montreal in Canada, where he'd learned to pour, pour cement, he'd worked with plaster, he'd worked with, with conventional builder's materials. He was also very interested in ropes, knots, the kind of the way that they were made, literally. And so, in a sense, the use of these non-conventional, in those days, non-conventional sculptural materials was kind of natural. So he started to experiment with sand, cloth, plaster, very early on, when he was, uh, when he was then at St. Martin's. He, started, he began his studies in, in Birmingham, and then a few years later, he went to St. Martin's. I think it's quite important, or at least Barry himself, Barry Fanagan himself, found it important that when he had been at Birmingham, he switched from architecture to sculpture. And in the sculpture school, he, he learnt and was immersed in all the traditional practices of sculptural approach. So learning the processes of casting, modelling, working with different materials. So those interests, in a way, stuck with him throughout his career. And then when he moved to St. Martin's, he was um, in, the, in the classes of Anthony Caro. And he found Caro's approach both fascinating and repellent. So on the one hand, he, he wanted to engage with the specificities of how Caro was thinking about space, three-dimensionality, structure, mass, and so on. But, but at the same time, he wanted to point to other ways of doing this, ways that actually, in a sense, pulled the plug out of those more formalist approaches. So the use of soft materials was absolutely key. And soft materials include cloth and sand and different forms of assembling those materials. So that with cloth, for instance, you see the threading of it and you see how it frays, how it's literally put together, how it's sewn, you see the stitching. Um, and these, these materials, um, he assembled in a way that utilized formal construction so that they, they had repetition. Repetition, seriality, use of color, a uniformity of color and a juxtaposition of color. So that, for example, with, with heap, you have these bags which are made of cloth, stitched together, filled with sand, sewn very carefully so that the end point of those bags has a very particular different type of sewing from the actual construction of the bag itself, different thread, different cloth and so on. But it riffs on, on minimalism because you see the repetition. It's extraordinary how early in, in his career, Barry Fanagan identified light in itself as a component of sculpture. So that light as an element of the whole understanding and approach and immersion in sculptural practice was really key. And he started working on a, a group of works which he called daylight light pieces. And these daylight light pieces, they're all sculpture and they use both projected light and the daylight through the day. 
So these works are durational pieces, much like the film that he had made, obviously a durational piece. But these light pieces are always site-specific. They have to be positioned very carefully in the space themselves. And here in this exhibition, we have three of these works on show. Um, two of them involve a, a cloth element using blue canvas. Um, one of them is cloth on the floor, which kind of renders a kind of landscape-y type feel to it uh, with light projecting on it. But the experience of the sculptures demands, in a sense, returning so that you see it as it changes through the day. Um, and then another of these works is, is literally a rectangular form pit stapled onto the wall over which there's a slide which kind of gives an edge to the whole surround of the canvas itself. So it kind of riffs minimalist painting. And at this point in his career, not only was he experimenting with light and thinking about light itself as a sculptural component, he was thinking about the relationships between painting and sculpture, and these relationships being, in a sense, arbitrary. The last uh, light piece, the other light piece that we have here in this exhibition is, is the corner piece, daylight corner piece, which is really quite a beautifully simple, simple but incredibly profound and complex in its simplicity, which illuminates the corner of a room. And in a way, quite mysteriously and poetically, it naturally draws attention to the space of the room and how we inhabit space and how we think about space, how we, how we experience it and maybe how we think about corners. I think the, the hair, the centrality of the hair is a, a both a very simple and very complex in Flanagan's practice. Um, Flanagan described how he first saw a hair, which in itself is contradictory because he had seen a hair when he was a child, but he described when he first saw a hair as an adult when he was driving across the Sussex Downs with his family on their way to Cornwall. And he, he saw on the Downs a couple walking with their dog and a hare leaping across the, the Downs behind where he was. And he literally described it like that, that he, he saw the hare leaping. And the, the couple and their dog were unaware of the hare. So the hare for him had this ability to be present without being seen. It had this kind of quixoticness, impossible to pin it down. The hair itself connected, as a, as a symbol, connected so many different cultural mythologies um, that Flanagan himself found fascinating. And he came across a copy in 1972 of The Leaping Hair, the book called Leaping Hair, as it came out. Um, and in 1972, Flanagan wasn't making hairs or wasn't working with hairs, but he was drawn to the hair. And in 1979, when he, towards the end of the year, made the first hair sculpture, it's a period that many artists were, had become, shall we say, disaffected with the purity of conceptualism, with the questions of minimalism, and were kind of engaged in a more visceral uh, reappraisal of what one might describe as traditional practices like painting and sculpture. So the sort of hands-onness, which was always important to, to Flanagan, you know, the, the feel of the material, the sense of the material, and the way his hand engaged with those materials, in a way came back to the fore with this lithe, lively, impossible to pin down animal. And for many people, uh, the hair is a form of surrogate, but it's a surrogate for us and our engagement uh, with the three world, three-dimensional world, and our engagement with notions of spirituality, notions of our feet on the floor, and how, how we literally experience space. So to describe it as self-portraiture, I'm not sure would be the way that Flanagan would have thought about it. I think that it's much more of a surrogate for our experience. And something that Flanagan talked about regularly was the responsibility of the artist, the responsibility of us as three-dimensional people to engage with the world of, of things, animals, materials, and with each other. So I think that it becomes a sort of metaphor for that form of engagement and responsibility. 
Flanagan sometimes worked extraordinarily quickly and very, very, very intently. So he would, he would work with a power of almost like a kind of superhero. This thing would be done very rapidly and very intensely. So literally overnight modeling, he used various different things. He used wax, he used clay, he used dental wax to make the sculpture, to wrap it around the armature, working very quickly. But then on other occasions, the process would be a longer one uh, and it would take more time to germinate. It was always a very, but the moment of, of creation was always very rapid, always very intense and very particular. There could be long periods though of contemplation when perhaps not a lot seemed to be happening and then it, it would all come together in the most extraordinary way. Flanagan was fascinated by the processes of casting, by the, uh, by the sort of alchemical process of lost wax casting. He also often would use a, um, an object, you know, a, make, a, make a mold from a real thing. Like upstairs, uh, we have a sculpture, record, and there's a, there's a listening instrument, a medical listening instrument, which has been cast. And this becomes part of the sculpture itself. Obviously the computer is from an actual computer, a scaled up model of a computer itself. But uh, using the, the real object and casting it, incorporating it in sculpture, was, was something that he did on many, many occasions. There are quite a few works on paper in this exhibition. There's a series of collages that are made with uh, children's sticky paper, different colours of paper, and uh, Flanagan's daughters were were using these materials. And so it was kind of natural for him to, to, to pick them up and to start utilizing them himself. So they form part of this investigation of space and also the way the, 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 the space on the paper, but also the way the uh, material is cut or torn or positioned, folded, creased, references the, the material of cloth. Um, and, and these shapes form sometimes more geometric shapes, sometimes more landscapey type shapes, uh, sometimes sort of investigating of formal properties, but always kind of riffing it. So pulling the, pulling the plug out on it in a way. Um, and you can see the way that the wetness of the sticky back paper has become smeared in some of them. So he doesn't want to remove that. So the processes are shown in a sense. Flanagan also did a lot of work with actually utilizing his fingerprint. So th this is a very interesting dynamic because the fingerprint, of course, is a sign of identity. And, you know, we have to do our fingerprints now for all sorts of reasons and obviously have always done so. But the, the ID of this is something that authenticates the work. So in the series of works upstairs, which are made with thumbprints, uh, we see literally that Flanagan has, has explored shape, movement, repetition across a series of different paperworks. I think that the way that Flanagan draws our attention to be open and to be curious, draws us, draws us towards a playful encounter that is both joyous and serious.